Good morning, uh, church. Good morning. So this morning, what we're going to discuss is, I think, one of uh, still problem that the church uh, is facing, church in general, the Lord's church is facing until today. And uh, survey had it that there's a decline of people going to church. Um, here in the U.S., amongst the churches of Christ, there was a significant decline of around 6% from 2016 to 2019. And it is still uh, growing. The decline is still growing up to this date. And um, it is, and it must be uh, addressed with, and it must be uh, dealt with. And uh, I'm just letting all, everybody knows of what's the dilemma. What is the church uh, facing right now uh, in the year 2023 and in the following years? Now, by church, I mean any form of religious group not only the churches of Christ, but all forms of religious group that worship God in general. You know, many are then distancing themselves from any religious affiliations and to start to practice their own faith, to start to practice their own, you know, set of uh, religious belief at their own convenience. Um, according to one survey, to, I've read an article from theguardian.com, Protestant churches closed last 2019. And uh, we have seen in the past, uh, in the post pandemic, that many churches, many congregations continue to close. And many continue to struggle until this very day. So, why are the people, why are people leaving the churches? Now, even, with, even before the pandemic, even before COVID 19, why the churches are declining. Now, surveys had it that there's a decline of people because, you know, they feel unwelcome because of the hypocrisy in, inside the church. So this morning, we will, we will dig into some of those, some of the um, prevalent uh, reason why churches are declining and why Many Christians are moving away, distancing away from their Christian life and Christian family. Okay. So we will talk this morning, the real talk of why people are not into the church, are not inside the body of our Lord. We will try to give some insights on how we should deal with them as members of the Lord's body. So this morning, we will talk about the irrelevancy of ecclesia. People nowadays, they think the church is irrelevant. Okay? The ecclesia. Now, first and foremost, let's just do some uh, def definition, defining, sort of a uh, review for all of us. What is ecclesia, by the way? What is the church, as we oftenly call it? So one reason why people still, they don't belong in the ecclesia or in the church or they are living the Lord's body is because they don't know the importance of the church. That's one reason why they are living. That's one reason why they are, they are not in the body of the Lord. Now, one writer, he observed that people are divided to the importance of the church in their lives. They had not seen the importance of the Lord's body being inside the church. That's why they are living. That's why most people are not inside the Lord's body. Now, we, we really need to address what is the church and what is the importance of the church. As belonging to the church of Christ, we all need to get that address, to get the message across uh, to everybody. Now, what is ecclesia? Ecclesia, or the church, people called out from the world and to God. The universal body of believers whom God calls out from the world and into his eternal kingdom. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, that was read a while ago, you see that we are those who are called out. 
you called out from darkness and into his marvelous lights. Ephesians 5 verse 8, for you were formerly in darkness. We are formerly in darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. So Ecclesia, the church, all of us, we are the ones called out from darkness and into his marvelous light. We are the ones called out to walk in union with God. So that's basically what Ecclesia means. And the, the question is, what is the importance? So what, Brother Mike? What is the importance of me being in the church? What is your importance? What is the importance in your life being in the body of Christ? Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. And he gave himself up for her. Now, it is very clear that Jesus died for the church. Oh, yes, his death is for everybody. He died for all, no doubt. But look again in John 3.16. In John 3.16, tells us again that Jesus died for all. But you see, you know, salvation will not be rewarded to all. Because there is a condition. A condition to have that salvation. For you to have that salvation. There must, there must be something that we must do in order to obtain that salvation. God did their part. And oh yes, you and I, we must do our part, for us to have that salvation. Now, it says there, whoever believe, those who will give their faith in him, those who will be obedient to him, those who will heed you know, the call of lifelong servitude to him and take their life away from darkness and into a new life with him, being faithful till the end. Now, these are the people that form the church of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those who rejected, those who rejected that call, who have not have that obedient faith in Christ, you know, the blood of Jesus will not have an effect on them because they rejected Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is only to those that in his church that Jesus died that his blood will have an effect. That's why, again, it says, that Jesus gave himself for her, pertaining to the church. Jesus gave himself up to the church. The ecclesia, the people that accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. So therefore, Jesus Christ giving himself up for the church, he is the Savior. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, which is, he is, the Savior. So, what is the importance of the church? Without being in the body of Christ, there is no salvation in you. Now, if we just do our faith, if we just do our own thing, how can there be any salvation? Doing it your way, Doing it in our own faith, practicing our own faith apart from those called out from your brothers and sisters in the Lord, you know, it's not doing Jesus' way. Now, for example, if you're missing Sunday worship, if you're missing the fellowship, for example, Sunday, okay? How can you say that you belong to the body of Christ? Since first day of every week, it is commanded by God that all saints everywhere should gather and worship him in spirit and in truth. Now the message must be clear that, and we must let the word out to everybody, the importance of being in the body of Christ. Now, his church, his ecclesia, and in his body, there is salvation. And apart and outside of the body of Christ, there is no salvation. Because he died for the church. If you remove yourself from that body of his, you nullify 
you nullify that hope of eternal life that is given to his ecclesia. So that's one problem that the church are facing until this very moment. People, they don't know what is the importance of being in the body of the Lord. Why will I go and be there with all those people in that four corner or corners of the room, worshiping with them? Why? I don't see any importance to it. So therefore, it is our mandate, my dear brothers and sisters, to let them know the importance of the so-called ecclesia, of the so-called church. Now, another problem that we are facing, the church of our Lord is facing, is the so-called hypocrisy inside the church. The hypocrisy of all, I would say, in general. A survey years back by the Barna Group. Barna Group, a known research organization focused on the intersection of faith and culture, they reported a big percentage of why non-Christians rejected Christianity is because of this word, hypocrisy. It is the same reason why Christians are leaving the Lord's body. We're not getting people in, and yet people from the inside, they're going out because of hypocrisy. Okay. Now, I have talked to people. In my many years serving the Lord, I have talked to many people. And sure enough, it is our hypocrisy. Well, of course, I'm not talking about you. Of course not. I meant in general. Right? It is the hypocrisy of those belonging to the Lord's body that's keeping them out. And because of this experience they had, it's kind of hard for them to go back and kind of distance themselves you know, from the members of the Lord's body. In uh, zondervanacademic.com, they stated, modern people contend that the greatest proof that God does not exist is the behavior of Christians themselves. So alarming, and yet that is happening. What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy, according to Greek, is judging under like a performer or an actor, acting under a mask, a theater actor, a two-faced person, a hypocrite whose profession does not match their practice. Someone who says one thing but does another. So that's what basically hypocrite means. Now, hypocrisy of the member of the Lord's church in general, it is not just a perception. Mind you, it is not just a perception of somebody or a perception of those outside the church. It is actually fact one. They saw it. And maybe they have been a victim themselves by such hypocrisy of the Lord's, the member of the Lord's body. Now, it is really sad, but this is reality of the Lord's body have to deal until this very moment. So what are just some of the things pointed out about our hypocrisy? Number one is our failure in our moral standards. No doubt that people look to you being a member of the Lord's body for the highest standards of morality. We are like the role model, right? People look to us because we have Christ, because we say that we are Christ-centered. That's why people looking inside, from the outside, they look at you as a role model for morality. Okay. Now, imagine a preacher every Sunday preaching about Jesus Christ, preaching about being Christ-centeredness. And then on the weekdays, you will see him drunk. I have seen preachers. I have seen preachers in my life. People claiming to be Christians. After Sunday, you will see them with a bottle of gin 
on the streets, swaying. And some, you know, I think they lose their mind. See, preacher inside the casino, gambling. So imagine those people claiming to be Christians, holding the Bible every Sunday, preaching about Christ-centeredness, and yet we can see them in the places and doing things that are not within the principle of the Bible, that are contrary to what they are teaching. Imagine a so-called Christian, you know, beating up his wife. Imagine a so-called Christian beating up her husband. You know? And, you know, parents, like you and I, children look to us for morality, right? Now, are you sure that your neighbors are not looking at you for morality? Are you sure that your office mates are not looking at you for morality? Are you sure? You see, as Christians that we are, as we have accepted the call of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know, we are already transformed. But of course, there is a struggle. But in that struggle, we try to do things that God wants us to do. Now, we used to be at the dark. But as part of the ecclesia, being the called out, we are not part of that darkness anymore. We don't do those sinful things anymore. We don't live in the past. So to be living in that sinful nature is still up to this day. You are not truly a converted individual. We are under the mask, claiming to be real Christians, but we aren't. We're actually still that sinful person just pretending to be Christians. And that's why we fail, most people, because of, because of our hypocrisy. Now, Apostle Paul reminds us that we must be therefore be careful how we walk. You be careful how you walk because people are looking at you. Everybody is looking at us. Another thing of our hypocrisy is our being judgmental, they say. Us being so critical. And this is another big dilemma the Lord's body is facing until this very moment. Is that we are labeled, Christians are labeled judgmental, critical. Way back home, while we do our track distribution in a certain province, we do door knocking, we talk to people on the streets. You know what? They called us, you are hypocrites. I have been called hypocrites many times. Why? Probably they experience hypocrisy by the Lord's members in their lifetime. That's why when, when we are giving to them the track, when we are explaining to them of who we are, they, are, they labeled us as hypocrites. And one time, one person, he went out of his store, mini store, and he told us, you guys are a hypocrites. I told him, why? You just want our money. Come on. Right? It hurts us. I was like bunch in the face. What? See? Well, probably, I was thinking probably it's one of their experiences. See, we are so critical of other people that we are unaware that we are tearing them apart. We are so confident in our Christianity that in our confidence, it leads us to arrogance, that we feel we know better and far superior to others because we are Christians, because we are the church leaders. Therefore, we enforce what we say. To other people. We sometimes insist that our judgment is a form of positive criticism. Well, in fact, it is condemnation. Jesus Christ 
you know, don't was uh, don't want us to have that kind of attitude. When he said, "Why do you look at the speck of the sawdust in your brother's eye? Remove the plug. Remove that plug. Remove that log in your eyes first. You know, Jesus was pointing the general attitudes of the scribes and the Pharisees by being so critical of others. You know, while trying to elevate themselves." by hypocritical actions of being better. Now, many non-Christians felt that they were more being condemned rather than being built up. You know, Christians were so critical of other people's sin that the so-called or the so-called Christians have a plank, have a big lug in their eyes that blinds them not to see their own sins, not to see their own fault. Now, you know, Christians are leaving church because fellow members and church leaders are very critical of them in the way they serve God, particularly in sharing the gospel. I had, a, had many conversations before with many Christians from different groups. Okay? Why they leave, they, or they left the church. And just recently, I heard someone from the net okay, while, while viewing that video, I heard him say that he left the church for the same sentiments of what I have heard way, way, way back. And what is that sentiment? You, need, you see, they said that fellow members, they were quick to criticize them in their longing to reach out the lost souls. They said that they were not allowed you know, to spread their wings in, in that group, in the church that they attend to. Now, instead of encouragement, they were faced with such criticism amongst their group in doing ministry, in reaching out the lost souls. Where in the first place, they said there's nothing being done. Now, there's something being done. They were met with so much criticism by the Lord's body. So they left. Now, many have forgotten this, that the Lord's church, it is not our church. It is not my church. It is Christ's church. And we have a mandate to spread the gospel. Apostle Paul even said that whatever motivates them in preaching, in reaching out the lost souls, for Jesus Christ, he said, he rejoiced. You see? But that does not matter. Whether their motives are false or genuine, the message about Christ is being preached either way, I rejoice. Another example that they said of our hypocrisy is we are an unloving community. You know, we humans, we are a social being. You and I, we are a social being. There is a need for us to connect, right? There, there, there's a need for us to be involved. There is a need for us to love and be loved. You know, non-Christians, they go to church because they are longing for a community where they will feel welcome. Now, going to our moral standards a while ago, people deem that the church people, because... Christ is the center of their life, they deem us as a bunch of loving people, as a bunch of welcoming people, understanding people. That's why they go to church. Unfortunately, there were those that find the church as an unloving and unwelcoming community. Now, I, for one, I had that fair share of experience. Okay. But let me share you one of my experience. You know, wherever I go, when I go out of town, I normally look for, before I go out of town, I normally look for any brethren to the place where I am going to. And I look for the nearest congregation, the nearest body of Christ to that place. And guess what? In 2019, my first time to be here in the U.S., and I was asking the brethren back home, 
if they knew someone that lived in Daly City, because I will be spending a few days there in my sister in law. Because I want to have fellowship. I want to get in touch with my fellow brothers and sisters in Daly City. And because I know that I will be staying on a Sunday in, in, in Daly City, I look for the nearest congregation. And I met the brethren at Lake Merced in Brotherhood Way. And I was greeted with a warm welcome with all the brethren. And the following Sunday, I was again greeted with a very warm welcome by this congregation. And this is my first, that was my first time to meet most of you. I had a wonderful experience. And also, that's where I had my first El Polio Loco experience with the Cachelas, with Brother Pete and Sister Faith. Mm -hmm. As you know, there's a story. There's a story. One Sunday morning, you know, a son told his mother, Mom, I'm going to this church. Really? Yes, Mom. It's my first time to go to church. And the mom was so excited. And his and her son was excited also. So the son went to the church. Then after two hours, he went back home. And then the mother asked, the son, son, how was the experience? How was it? I'm not going there anymore. I'm not going to church anymore. Why? The mother asked. And the son said, you know, I discovered in the church that I have a super power. Huh? Yeah, ma'am. I discovered I have a super power. Because I was invisible the whole time. Really? So can you imagine? Can you imagine those non-Christians, those visitors sitting at the pew? After the church service, they were invisible. Okay, I'm here. See? And I have my fair share of that kind of experience with fellow brothers and sisters. Come on. Right? Others felt unwelcome because of the way we look at how they dress. Because of the way, you know, they look. Okay? Again, we are so being judgmental in general. You know, people are not in their Sunday dress. And, and, and this guy, one time, this guy had a long rock and roll hair. And another guy had tattooed, tattooed all over his body. And they stopped attending church. I said, why? Why? Because the members there, you know, they were being stumbled at us. Come on, they are non-Christians. They are non-Christians. And we are Christians and we are being stumbled by non-Christians. Having tattooed, who wanted to connect with Christ. Come on. Right? And these are happening. These, these are happening all over. Another story, a couple, not yet married, but living together, almost left the church. They were attending a local church for quite a while. Now, once, one day, they became the talk of the church. Why? The buzz was, you know, they keep on attending this church, this congregation. And until now, they are unmarried. How come? So they're being the talk of the church. Now, a good thing, a level-minded member of that congregation, talk to the couple, you know, don't leave. If you want to connect to Christ, don't leave. Let them be. And he talked to some of the people that are making the buzz. Stop doing that. Stop doing that. And good thing, good thing, the couple, they stayed. And guess what? They are an active member of the church 
until this very day. And they are now married. They are now married. See? Now, these are the realities and legitimate concerns. As individuals of, and members of the Lord's church, we are to reflect what the body of Christ is about. So the question is, what I will do? What you must do? Now, again, in our scripture reading, we are a chosen people. The verse that was read a while ago by Brother Ryan, it used the word, a chosen generation. The word generation from the Greek word is genos, which means kindred, family. Family. Guess what? You are a chosen family. And guess what? We are a family. A family! Familia! And as a family, we must love one another. We must love one another. As a family unit, how do you love your children? How do you treat your children? You see? Will you not teach your children the importance of family? Will you not advocate to their friends or to your friends the importance of family? I know you will, and I know you would. Okay. Likewise, it is important for us to teach members and non-Christians alike the importance of ecclesia. It must be our advocacy. Now, how do you build your children's, as part of the family, how do you build your children's character? How do you boost their morale? By being critical? I don't think so. By being judgmental of them? I don't think so. By continuously talking about their shortcomings? I don't think so. How bad they are? I don't think so. You are building walls rather than building bridges. Or probably you would encourage them by being kind enough to them. Probably by sharing your experience. Probably by sharing your failures with them. And probably they could get something out of that. All right? Now, for husband and wife in the family, how do you build a stronger and lasting relationship by opening up old wounds over and over again? I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, by, by uh, carrying with you and reminding yourself every day of the sin that your husband made many years back, or by pampering the hurt made by your wife years back? I don't think so. I don't think so. We are pushing our family away rather than keeping them in. Right? We cannot build a strong and lasting relationship by chopping each other down bit by bit. And we cannot build a strong church. We cannot build a strong family inside the church by chopping each other down bit by bit. Nobody would like to be in a house where it is bound to collapse because it will kill them. We are a royal priesthood. You know, the priest's essential duty in the Old Testament is to mediate. They act as intercessor. They pray to God and on the behalf of the Israelites, of the people, by teaching the people the laws and decrees. That's what normally the priests do in the Old and did in the Old Testament. By principle, we must do the same. We link people to God. We don't chop them off. We don't make to have to distance them from God. We link them to God. Those people are coming to church, probably they need healing. And we must be there for them to heal them, especially of their spiritual illnesses. You know, people are not going inside the building because all of this problem. We are a holy nation. We are a holy nation. Again, we are called to be different. You and I, we are called for holiness. We uphold the standard, high standard of morality. You know, holiness must be in all our conduct. Now, how can we get people inside the body of the Lord's church if we are full of hypocrisy? 
How can we encourage the young ones to stay in the church if we fail them in our morality? We are God's own possession. We are God's special people. Peter alludes this verse to the Israelites as his special people, his special possession. Now, and how they are special? It is distinguished, they are to distinguish themselves from other nations by following, by observing, walking, and keeping the laws and ways. By the same principle, we must therefore follow, observe, walk, and keep God's laws and ways. Now, individually, we must embody, therefore, what a true member of the Lord's church is. Instead of being critical, why not be more complimenting? Come on. Instead of being judgmental, why not be more compassionate? Come on. Instead of being so trivial, why not be more considerate? Come on. Why not I be more loving? Why not I be more forgiving? Why not I be more understanding? Why not I be more and more like Christ than I be more and more of myself? They say by the year 2050, I hope I will not be alive to see it, but they say by year 2050, there will be a great decline in the Lord's church if these concerns and some others will not be addressed. Now, the Lord needs you. The Lord needs you in this church. He needs one like you. Now, can you say to the person beside you, he needs one like you. He needs one like you. But repeat, he needs one like you. I think I was more excited a while ago than you are being the, uh, announced as a deacon because I was telling Brother Derek, we should have all the elders lined up here and Brother Pete come here. I forgot that you would be installed in two weeks' time. <laughs> but I will leave you with this word, words from John Lewis. If not us, then who? If not now, then when? Brothers and sisters, friends, the gospel is yours. Will you rise up to the challenge despite of all these things happening? Still, where can we put our trust in? Where can we go but to the Lord and be in his body? in his church, in his ecclesia. Now may I invite those who have not accepted our Lord Jesus Christ, be one of his true servants, you know, and join us as we fight a good fight for his glory. To God be the glory. Good morning.